You ever play a horrible game and feel kind of bad about it? I mean, not just because it's bad and you wasted time and money on it, but because it's bad to an absurd degree, so much that the bad design decisions pile up the more you play to the point of being funny, and where the circumstance is different, it could have been a much better game. We'll be looking at one such game today. In the year 1984, game developer Hot B released a game for the FM7 and PC88 computers called In the Psychic City. It looks to have been quite a unique game at the time. I haven't actually played it because I couldn't find the ROM, but it seems to play somewhat like Nihon Falcom's Dragon Slayer, also released that year, only this game uses a cyberpunk setting rather than medieval European fantasy. Your character is psychic, which allows him to resist the mind control of an evil supercomputer who has everyone else trying to kill you. Even though it looks primitive, it did catch my interest. Fast forward three years. Dragon Quest had come out and been very successful. Hot B noticed the success of the Famicom RPG and thought, Hey, remember that game in the Psychic City? Let's make a successor slash remake on the Famicom with a Dragon Quest style battle system. What could possibly go wrong? Everything. Even from the start, they made one critical error. They outsourced the development of the game to one single developer. Hoshi wo Mirohito, which translates to Stargazer, released in 1987 and is known in Japan as the legendary crap game. It has unique and ambitious ideas, but does way, way more wrong than right. It was developed by Naoki Morishima a solo developer who also made a bowling game I happen to own, and it wasn't really a bad game, so I think Stargazer's failures have more to do with Hot B overestimating Morishima than anything else. I mean, this isn't a simple little fishing game like Hot B's other stuff, this is a full-fledged role-playing game that's a lot to push on just one man. I can tell at least some effort went into this game too. Listen to that title screen music, it's actually really good. It evokes a feeling of dread and doom like no other Famicom music can. Maybe this won't be so bad after all. So let's press start and... There's no intro? Oh, um, I... I know! Let's see what the manual says. Sometime in the future there is a boy named Minami. He doesn't know who he is or where he is from. However, he is not without enemies. A group of fierce psychic hunters called the Death Psychics and the Guard Force, together with its army of robots, all seek to capture him because he is a powerful psychic. They find him and prepare to attack. A computer called Crew 3 was built inside of the metropolis of Arc City to oversee things. Crew 3 has now assumed complete control to the point of invading people's minds. The system was built to cleanse the city of people with harmful thoughts by using a form of mind control. The effects of Crew 3 are powerful enough to strip you of your very identity. However, there are a select group of people called Psychics who aren't affected by its mind control. And so, the Crew 3 begins to hunt them down, and these Psychics are captured and taken to Ark City, leaving the four main characters behind. Whoa, that's epic! It's just like Psychic City, except Psychic City had an actual intro! Oh, and this whole thing about the supercomputer is rarely, if ever, brought up again anyways, so I guess we can just ignore it in the end anyhow. Well, that's a waste of a good plot. Rather unfortunate. Also, I still have no idea where I'm actually going, so let's wander around and level up. Oh god, Minami walks at a snail's pace. Oh god, an enemy. Okay, the battle system. It's a fairly basic clone of Dragon Quest battle system, except you can choose the target of your attack. The first RPG to ever actually let you do that, in fact. Some fools think this is an astounding accomplishment worthy of Stargazer not having a spot on the list of the worst video games of all time, but I digress. Characters learn ESP abilities as they level up, and an interesting thing is you can spend more MP to make a bigger attack. Unfortunately, there are numerous problems. When you have multiple characters, you can select the order they move in, but you have to do that every turn for every battle. You also can't see the ones digit of your HP, which is just silly. Why couldn't they either fit five digits or cap it at 9,999? What's also annoying is that if ESP is selected and you have no MP left, you wind up wasting the turn because you can't back out of the command, and ESP is selected by default. The worst part, however, is that you can't flee any battles, which means if an enemy appears and you can't kill it, you are dead. 
This is all the result of some very basic failings in the realm of quality of life. Not that there's going to be much life left in you. <laughs> At this point, I'll be switching over to a partially complete translation of the game. Though the text is buggy in places, the patch also fixes the walking speed and adds an option to save the game. Oh right! Did I mention there's no hard save option in the original game? Instead, the game uses passwords of varying length, however. It seems that the password system does not accurately track progress, as I've seen it, my gold and experience decrease after loading. And considering the passwords can be up to 35 characters in length and can contain English and Japanese letters, that's going to be painful to enter every time you die. And you will die a lot. The initial area has six different enemies and only two of them can reasonably be killed at level... level zero? Ahem. The salamander is particularly infamous because it can paralyze your character. If that happens, the enemy wails on you until you die, since you can't cure it in any way. So it's a dice roll, you have to consistently run into the junk enemy if you want to level up and earn some money. Not that money matters, as there doesn't appear to be a town or store anywhere on the map. There doesn't appear to be, but there is. I'm dead serious. Do you see it here? You can't because the town is invisible. If we step left from where we started the game, there's... there's a town. And shops. And people, and why the hell was this place invisible on the map? RPGs are no stranger to hidden secret villages, but this is the first town in the game. Have mercy, Morishima! So this is Mammoth's Village. It's a safe place for psychics, so you should return here often after leveling. There's a healer and shops with armor and weapons. Careful though, whenever you buy a weapon or armor, whatever you had before is instantly discarded for the new item. Also don't buy the ray gun because it's a worse weapon than your bare hands! That... that's just cruel. Leveling up feels so worthless anyways because there are no bosses in this game. Like, at all. So leveling is pointless, right? I could just turn on a No Encounters Game Genie code. Well, you actually need to level up because leveling up increases four out-of-battle abilities. There's Break, which lets you break certain walls, but you never needed to complete the game. There's Jump, which lets you pass through walls and teleport, which is way more useful. Telepathy is needed to communicate with certain NPCs and is absolutely required in order to finish the game, and shield stops you from taking damage from certain floor tiles, which you wouldn't notice because those tiles don't indicate you're taking damage. You could be walking around and boom, you're suddenly dead. So if you walk into some of the trees in the village that look no different from any other tree, you'll collect fruits. These can be used to craft medicine, and this is pretty innovative too, but the way you craft it is to just pick the fruits in the correct order. Some NPCs tell you the order for certain potions, like the revive potion, but any other sequence I guess has to be blindly guessed. I never bothered with it anyways, you technically never needed to finish the game. It does have a use though. If you make it to the second town, that is a town, right? Well, it's actually visible this time at least. This is Deuce Village. Everyone in town is sick with the disease. One NPC which you need a high enough jump skill to reach will tell you how to make a potion to cure it. Okay, let's exit the town and... Why did I just warp to the starting point? Okay, one of the ingredients is in a place called the Shifting Forest to the east. Stepping on any of the tree tiles shown here has a random chance to send you to a cave with the ingredient inside. How you're meant to figure this all out is beyond me. So we leave and I just warp back to the starting point again. Um, see, this is another one of the humorously bad things about this game. There are three locations that I'll call teleport points for the sake of simplicity. Anytime you go outside a map, say by leaving town, you end up at the nearest of these points. So exiting Deuce puts you back at Mamus. This doesn't happen with tiles that place you at a particular location. It's nonsensical, but you can actually use it to a, your advantage, as you'll see me do. So you craft the potion and take it to Deuce. Instantly, the entire town is cured just by having it in your inventory when talking to someone. Strange. Doing this isn't necessary to complete the game, but it does let you get bombs, which blow up walls that you could have just used break on or pass through with jump. This is so poorly designed. Let's leave and head to the next location, avoiding the shifting forest this time. Just walk around the outer coastline and you're there. This is the underpass. 
Invisible items are scattered around here, including some golden ID cards, and oh god, we'll talk about ID cards later. There's a power generator here. Turning it on opens a shortcut from Mammoth to the next location in the game, making the underpass almost entirely useless since you can just use the shortcut after this. There's another character here though, and he actually joins you. His name is Shiva, and he's psychic too! Different characters can be more or less skilled at out-of-battle abilities, and Shiba's claim to fame is teleporting, Faror's win style. You can set a teleport point in any town, meaning anywhere the town music plays, and warp back to it when outside of town. This is insanely helpful, though you still have to level him somewhat and earn him some money because for some reason gold isn't shared by the party, each character has money in their individual pockets and you can't exchange it at all. And inexplicably, one enemy gives the same amount of gold to all party members. At this point, I just prefer to turn on the EXP and money cheat codes. I'm sure nobody would mind, it lets me show off that battle portraits actually change as the characters level up. That's a surprisingly neat touch. Taking the shortcut leads us to Arc City, which was mentioned in the intro. The enemies here are tougher, and the battle music is different too. Not a whole lot better than the first song, really. Two towns are here, the residential area and the government area. Exiting either sends you to a seemingly unrelated tunnel for no reason at all. This is where Shiva's teleporting comes in handy. In the residential area, we find our third party member. Ein... Ein... I... Uh... Okay, I figured Shiva was captured, but here we have a psychic literally in Ark City and... Never mind, who cares about the plot? Ayn has the best telepathy and she is absolutely required to finish the game. I don't know why she's in the fourth character slot, but I'm not complaining. Oh, and if you use telepathy on one of the robots, it spits out seemingly random numbers, but it's actually hexadecimal ASCII text that reads, Hot B. Okay, someone must have been really proud of this if they put something like that there. Oh yeah, and you see those gray doors? You need ID cards to open them. Thing is, the card gets consumed completely when you open them, so it's very possible to get trapped on one side of the door if you don't have enough cards. That's... Th there's no excuse for this! Morishima, what were you thinking? <laughs> oh well, you can save ID cards by just passing through walls when you can anyways. In the government area, there's a guy who sells information. Purchase the 300 gold hint, which for whatever reason makes the NPC beneath him give you a yellow ID card. This card, oddly enough, isn't consumed, but it won't be used yet. You don't need to get to the fourth, or third, I guess, party member to win the game, but in case you do, head to the hospital in the residential area. Notice how one of these NPCs seems to be inaccessible. Well, you can actually break the wall to get to him, although you need a silver ID to enter that door. Which means you need another one to get out, since you can't teleport out of here. Talk to the NPC. He refers to you to someone named Max. Exit the building and speak to this NPC. He tells you that Max is dead. Okay then? Go back inside and use up two more silver IDs to talk to the NPC inside the room again. He refers you to Natasha. Hopefully the NPCs don't block your way out of here. Otherwise you have to sit and wait for them to get out of the way again. More bad design. Didn't we learn our lesson from Final Fantasy? Head to the residential area. The NPCs you need to talk to are here. Fortunately, you don't need ID cards to get to them, but you need two blue IDs to finish this side quest. After chatting it up with them, go back to the government area and enter the isolated building. Talk to the girl in pink and she joins you. This is Misa. All she does is shield the party from damage tiles. I guess that's useful, but there's a task of this game that skips her completely, so who cares? To finish the game, we need to enter the space tower in the city. However, to enter there, we need an item called the Oxygen Pipe. Thing is, there is no way to know where it is. Ever! No hints, it's invisible on the map as always, and to make matters worse, the game only indicates that you've picked it up with a barely audible sound. No message box or anything. So where is this plot critical item? Why, it's in the stupid tunnel you warp to whenever you exit town. Look, see? Right there. I got it. I swear it just gets worse and worse the more you play this. Oh, and picking that up triggers another shortcut from Mamos, Mamos to uh, outer space. Well, this is the end game. The enemies get stronger, the NPCs at this point can only be talked to with Ayn's telepathy, 
and there's not really anything of interest past here, it's just talking. Well, for some odd reason you can walk on the walls regardless of character at this point, so while we watch the final events of the game unfold, here's the big plot twist. There is no supercomputer, and the entire world we've seen is actually on a giant space colony run by dolphins. No, really. Dolphins. They're trying to decide whether or not to save or exterminate humans, the latter being what the orcas want. No, I'm not kidding! The humans know next to nothing about what's really going on, they just forgot. Your characters have made it all the way up here, however, so we get to engage in citizen politics. After doing a ton of legwork, teleporting and talking to dolphins forever, here are the possible endings to the game. The dolphin asks what to do now, and the first option is to live with them on their planet. This gives the best ending. The second option is to live on the colony while the dolphins say so long and thanks for all the fish and go home. It's not a great ending. The third option has you trying to kill the dolphins, but they instantly wipe you out and blow up the humans with you. All three endings have exactly the same background image and music, which is pretty disappointing, but it's still a better ending than the original ending to Mass Effect 3. But wait! There's more! It turns out that the ROM contains an unused fourth ending. It seems to be a version of ending number three, where the player fights the dolphins and wins. The text heavily implies that there was going to be an actual boss fight. That's a shame, though if there was going to be a boss fight, why would that ending require more work than the theoretical best ending? So that's Stargazer, one of the worst RPGs ever made. One of the worst Famicom games ever made, one of the worst games ever. Though I'm not sure it fully deserves that reputation. Oh sure, I would sooner play Deadly Towers than this. But when I was researching Stargazer, I truly felt that there could have been something more than worst Famicom RPG ever here. And I'm not the only one who thinks that. Stargazer has a sort of cult following. There's a fan-made patch that makes the graphics better and balances the game. There's fan art of the characters, including a crossover with another heart, Hot B game, Palamedes. There are fan games, including a full-blown Windows remake of Stargazer, with much improved graphics, gameplay, and story, including restoring the original unused fourth ending, complete with actual boss fights. It's definitely worth trying, if a translation ever comes out.